Good afternoon. Uh, this is Chair Ruth Richardson and pursuant to House Rule 10.1, I call this remote meeting of the Education Policy Committee to order. Um, Ms. Larson, will you please take the roll for uh, attendance? Chair Richardson? Present. Vice Chair Hassan? Present. Representative Erickson? Present. Representative Drozkowski? Present. Representative Bennett? Present. Representative Berg? Present. Representative Bow? Present. Representative Christensen? Present. Representative Edelson? Present. Representative Feist? Present. Representative Frazier? Present. Representative Jordan? Present. Representative Keeler? Present. Representative Moeller? Present. Representative Mueller? Present. Representative Poston? Present. Representative Scott? Representative Scott? Representative Erdahl? Representative Erdahl? I believe Representative Erdahl is excused for his uh, vaccination. Thank you. Representative Waslowick? Present. <coughs> Madam Chair, a quorum is present. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll move on to the approval of minutes. Uh, Representative Moeller, have you had an opportunity to review the January 20th minutes? I have, Madam Chair, and I'll move those minutes. Thank you. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? The January 20th minutes are approved. Uh, Representative Moeller, I'll stick with you again. Have you had an opportunity to review the January 25th minutes? Yes, Madam Chair, I have, and I'll move the January 25th minutes as well. Thank you. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any, any opposed? The minutes for January 25th are approved as well. Uh, before we uh, get into today's uh, presentation and bill discussion, I just wanted to make a couple of announcements on some time certain to ensure that we are able to end uh, uh, today's uh, hearing on time. We are planning to move the uh, amendment that was received by 2.15 p.m. today. Uh, we plan to vote on that amendment by 2.20 p.m. and we'll have a final vote on the bill being presented by 2.25 p.m. so that we can ensure that we are ending uh, today's session on time. Um, I'll also ask uh, members to hold their questions today until the end of, of public uh, testimony. Uh, you can raise your hand, we'll keep track of individuals with questions and we'll get through uh, as many as we can uh, with the time that we have available uh, to us today. Uh, first up, I would like to uh, introduce uh, the presenter from uh, Pelsby, Dr. Elena Bailey. She is the Director of Education Policy for the Minnesota Professional Educator Licensing and Standards uh, Board. Uh, Ms. Bailey, uh, you have the floor. Madam Chair, members of the committee, thank you for having me. I'm going to uh, share my screen for us. So bear with me. All right, hopefully you should be able to see all of that. Um, yeah. Um, so uh, I'm here today to, hopefully you can see the slides, right? Yes. Yes, we can see the slides. Thank you. Um, you can, um, I'm here today to share with you some data. I was asked to present some data from our recently published supply and demand report, um, as well as to articulate the board's formal support. Ms. Bailey, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but if you could speak up a little uh, louder, we're having some difficulty hearing you. 
Sorry about that. I can try to Can you hear me better now? That's that's a little bit better. Yes. All right. I'll I'll use my teacher voice. So hopefully that works. Um, so I'm here today to uh, share with you to present some data from our supply and demand report that was published last week, as well as to share or articulate the board's formal support for the Increased Teachers of Color Act. Um, this is something the board has voted to formally support over the past few years. And this year in particular, we were able to meet and have um, Paul represent the coalition and come speak with several of our committees, as well as the, the whole board to talk through kind of each of the provisions in the bill. Um, we are very excited about um, what this bill would do to formalize and to ensure the continuation of work that Pelsby has been doing informally through um, cross agency kind of initiatives and stakeholder engagement. So there's a lot that we are very um, supportive of and excited about and I will connect that to some of the data we talk about here today. Um, there are a few things I wanted to mention up front that we um, would encourage the committee to discuss or in, in kind of further consideration as you hear the bill and the testimony today. Um, the first item is that we are very supportive of the um, establishing specific targets for increasing teachers of color and indigenous teachers. Um, however, we would ask maybe further discussion or consideration of what that looks like. Um, and I was planning to say this before uh, even seeing the amendment, just in case anyone's wondering. But um, we would encourage some discussion of, is that you know, a general increase in teachers who hold a license? Is it teachers who have a full professional license, meaning a tier three or tier four license? Teachers who've demonstrated that they've met kind of the standards in the state for the profession, or what, how would that be defined? So that's one thing we would encourage further discussion around. Um, and the other thing is something our board has been um, trying to work on over the past few years, and that's the establishment of a teacher survey. So as you'll see, and we'll talk through some numbers here, um, you know, we have data on teachers who hold a license who are on an assignment in a public school, but we don't have direct information from teachers on school climate, why they stay in the profession, why they leave. And that would help us um, really on the retention end, which we know tends to be where we're losing, you know, really damaging those numbers of teachers of color and indigenous teachers in the profession of Minnesota. Um, so we think having that information directly from them would go a long way towards meeting those state goals. So I'll move on to um, some numbers for you. And hopefully now you can hear me already. I'm just going to assume so and keep plowing along. Um, this comes directly from our supply and demand report. And um, you know, you've heard kind of some mention of the 5.6% of teachers of color who hold a license in the state. And we share this with you with kind of a caution because there's a number of factors that impact this data. So I'm glad to be here today to share some of that context. So this gives you a picture of every individual that holds a tier license um, broken down by tier level and race or ethnicity. However, we did not include life licenses. So life licenses, they used to be issued by the Board of Teaching. Those are primarily held by um, older, predominantly white teachers. So removing that does change the percentage or the proportions that you're seeing here. The other, um, there's a few other things that shape this data. So one, this is the first year we've had changes to reporting. So districts have changed the way they are able to report to include a multiracial, multi-ethnic category. And similarly, Pelsby has changed from using state to federal categories, which means the inclusion of that Hawaiian uh, Pacific Islander as well as the multiracial category. So what we've seen uh, is in certain districts, for example, one, we had about 150 teachers who were last year, the previous year had been identified as white are now being categorized as multiracial because they can select white and another racial or ethnic category. So all that to say, some of these changes aren't necessarily a shift in who's come into the profession, but rather a shift in how people are identifying or being identified. Um, there also were some errors in the data itself. So we get a lot of this from the staff automated reporting uh, report that districts fill out. And we had, for example, a major metro district had an error in their system that categorized their white educators as Asian and then a bunch of other groups as different races. 
So we work to manually correct that. And then we notice some other smaller districts. Um, but because of that, we're not, we can't offer 100% confidence in the accuracy of this data. Um, we have worked with IT to ensure that we won't have some of these issues going forward. But this year, we kind of offer a word of caution when you're looking at some of this data. The final piece of context I want to offer is that this is the first year you're seeing percentages just based off of tiers. So we had that extension in the 1819 year. And so the 1920 data is full picture, so to speak, of tier licensure. But many individuals who previously held permissions, like the community expert, the non-licensed community expert, or other non-renewable types of permissions, now are falling under that tier one and tier two license. So they're being counted as license holders where they previously weren't. So that shifts some of the demographics you're going to see here. Uh, so all that to say that as you're getting this bigger picture and seeing that 5.6% and maybe looking and comparing to previous years of people who hold a license, not necessarily people who are using that license in a classroom, to be clear, uh, that there are many caveats to that data. There are some conclusions um, that we can draw, which I'll maybe speak to a little in the next slide or two. The next slide, um, you know, you have this percentage and we wanted to give you the raw numbers as well, because as you look here, you'll see, you know, 7.7% 7 7 here for tier one, 6.04% uh, here compared to 1.9 and 1.2. And that seems like a big difference, right? Um, but when you look at the numbers, it gives you, I think, a better context for understanding what this looks like for the individuals that make up the profession in the state. So the great majority, we're talking 104,000 um, teachers, hold a tier three or a tier four license. So this gives some context when you're looking at those percentages on the different tiers by race and ethnicity to the actual individuals that hold the license and make up the field. So lots of caveats for this data, but um, you know, we can maybe conclude that there were some minor increases um, due to the way that people are now categorized on the tier system and some other shifts. Um, but I think larger pattern when you're looking in terms of policy is even if we consider increases and in people bringing into the field, something we've addressed in our supply and demand report is that statewide, we're still having an enormous problem on the end of retention. So any kind of gains are being offset in terms of loss of teachers of color and indigenous teachers, which is why we're very excited about the provisions that specifically work towards retaining teachers of color and indigenous teachers, which I'll reiterate that at the end. The final um, slide or data I wanted to show you is the proportion of teachers of color in comparison to students of color. So I will again, give you some caveat or some context here. Um, this comes from assignment data. So to get region or where they're working, we get that from the district. So what that means is this data is not unduplicated. So a teacher can be on an assignment or working in multiple districts, and they will show up multiple times in this data. They also may be working in multiple regions. So then they would show up in those multiple regions. So that 5,497 is not an unduplicated number. So what I would say to you is when you look at that 7%, the best way to understand that is to see that teachers of color represent 7% of the assignments in the state, not that they represent 7% of teachers in classrooms. I wanted to add that clarification there. I think the bigger takeaway, um, what I would encourage you know, to, to think about as you inform your policy conversations, is that again, regardless of how we're looking at that, the disparity between the percentage of teachers of color and indigenous teachers in classrooms and the percentage of students of color and indigenous teachers, uh, students, excuse me, remains disparate, right? So that is still an issue that we have not, you know, fully addressed. And so the measures that are in this bill are much needed to uh, closing that gap. So the last thing I'd like to share with you are just a few specific measures in the Increased Teachers of Color Act that our board is especially excited or supportive of. One are the supports for um, teacher preparation. So the Grow Your Own programs, the Collaborative Urban and Greater Minnesota Educator of Color grants, those are efforts that um, 
as I mentioned, our board is really encouraging the increase uh, of the support of teachers of color obtaining a tier three or tier four license as a full professional license that they can use in any district um, without and renew without limitation. And so the supports to get people through teacher preparation is one major way to do that. Um, something separate that Pelsby is working on our portfolio co co cohorts, excuse me, and then working with alternative providers. So all those pathways to really help get people to have that full professional license. Um, we are also very supportive of the efforts to remove testing barriers. So we found in our own data that 38.5% of teachers who hold a tier two license have already completed teacher prep. They're just waiting to pass their exams. So we are proposing, the board has proposed, you know, moving those exams to tier four so you at least can get people on a tier three, um, but it's very supportive of ITCA's stronger measure to remove those testing barriers altogether. And then finally, as I mentioned, we know that the larger issue here is retention. And so mentorship grants, um, you know, questions, uh, measures around school climate and cultural competency, curriculum that emphasizes ethnic studies and culturally responsive pedagogy are all measures that would help towards retaining our teachers of color and indigenous teachers, which is, you know, I would say an equally, if not greater need to meeting those state goals. So I'll end there. And I think I heard we're not doing questions, but I'm happy later to answer any questions you have. Thank you, uh, Ms. Bailey, for your presentation and for being uh, willing to stick around with us for a little bit. And if there are questions, we will definitely loop back around to those at the end. We're now going to move on to House File uh, 217. And um, Vice Chair Hassan, would you like to move your bill? Yes, Madam Chair, I move um, House File 217 to be referred to the Education Finance Committee. Thank you, Vice Chair Hassan. Uh, just uh, another reminder that we will uh, take up the amendment today at 2.15 um, after the public uh, testimony. Uh, Vice Chair Hassan, uh, please move forward with your presentation. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members. Today I present to you House File 217, an act relating to education is strengthening the Increased Teachers of Color Act seeking to increase the percentage of teachers of color and American Indian teachers in Minnesota, acquiring report, appropriating money, amending the following Minnesota statutes. This bill includes a variety of provisions aimed at attracting and preparing more teachers of color and indigenous teachers, increasing the percentage who complete the preparation programs and increasing the percentage that remain in teaching professions with the goal of helping the state to meet its goal of providing all students with equitable access to effective and diverse teachers who reflect the diversity of their students. Before I have Mr. Paul Spies do a walkthrough of the bill, I wanted to share a personal story to shed a light on the importance of having teachers of color and American Indian teachers in our classrooms. As some of you may know, my family and I fled from war and came to this country as refugees. Upon our arrival, I have realized my worldview has changed overnight. Imagine a 10-year-old who grew up thinking the world was black, arriving in Jacksonville, Florida, where almost everyone was white. What a cultural shock. My sibling and I were enrolled in public school. And besides my ELL teacher, Mrs. Lee, I had no teachers of color until my freshman year in college. Professor Johnson, who taught interpersonal communication, was my first uh, teacher of color. If I was able, I would have taken Professor Johnson's course over and over throughout my college experience as the impact he has made in my life was profound. For the first time, someone dared to speak about systemic racism, oppression, and the criminalization of black people in America. My whole public educational experience has been with some passionate educators who neither understood my culture nor a my struggle of I hope I came to this country, and others who were joy killers, who continuously reminded me how I would never amount to anything. I have been told not to waste my money on college because college was not for me. My survival depended on my family's support, which was plenty. Both my parents were believers of education being the key to lead successful and productive life. Thank God for that. As we know, representation matters. Kids learn best when taught by people who understand their communities and life experience, and all students benefit from diverse teachers. Our gaps are the, among the worst and persist. 
Minnesota continues to have some of the worst opportunity and achievement gaps in the country. And the severe and persistent shortage of teachers of color and American Indian teachers is a big reason for our persist, even though there has been a lot of focus on these gaps in the past 20 years. We are in a deep hole. While the students of color and Native American students make up about 35% of Minnesota's K through 12 students population, only 5.6% of teachers are teachers of color and Native American. This is an increase from two years ago when teachers of color and Native American teachers only made up 4.3% of teachers, but it's still a long way from proportional. Increased Teachers of Color Act 2020 responds to increased calls for racial justice from people all of all racial groups, age and geographic regions in summer of 2020. Research shows that all students from all racial and ethnic groups benefit from teachers of color and American Indian teachers. Society and the economy benefit from it as well. With that, Madam Chair, I invite Mr. Paul Spies to walk, do a walkthrough of the bill. Thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Spies. Um, please, uh, please proceed. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members. My name is Paul Spies. I'm legislative action team lead for the Coalition to Increase Teachers of Color and American Indian Teachers in Minnesota. The coalition's uh, uh, several dozen groups and 1,500 individuals throughout the state that's led by a majority of people of color and we've existed for the last five years uh, to try to change state policy and investments. HF 217 is intentionally a large and complex bill to address a complex systemic problem that has existed in our state for decades and worsens each year. We don't take comprehensive actions needed to address the need for more diverse teachers. This year's bill is a compilation of our 2019 and 2020 increased teachers of color acts with some updated language that reflects how the world has changed since last summer and the racial reckoning that occurred. Before I start doing a quick run through of the bill, I'd like to direct your attention to a few of the key documents provided by the coalition for this hearing. I'm gonna share my screen. One of those documents, can you see this Madam Chair? Okay. One of those documents for the whole committee uh, and the public is a listing of the most diverse school districts, uh, the diversity of students in your districts, and the licensed staff of color in your districts. So you can see a cover page here, along with, for each member, a drill down from state information. Another handout that we have in your virtual packet is 10 reasons why the Increased Teachers of Color Act needs to pass. A listing of several dozen organizational endorsements that we've received thus far for the 2021 Increased Teacher of Color Act. We also have posted a, a detailed bill summary to supplement the House Research Bill Summary. And this is organized thematically, this detailed bill summary by these bubbles, the attract and prepare goal of the bill, the increased program completion components of the bill, the increased retention components of the bill that all result in an increased percentage of teachers of color and American Indian teachers. And the final uh, handout for your packets is some excerpts from the most recent MTLE uh, test results by race and gender for the state of Minnesota teacher candidates. So in House File 217, sections one through three are focused on the world's best workforce. And here we're strengthening proposed amendments from the last two Increased Teachers of Color Act and providing some key definitions to terms that did not exist in the previous act. Uh, the section four is equitable school enhancement grants to support school districts in implementing the world's best workforce changes that they would have for their strategic plan. Section five focuses on the state goal to increase teachers of color with an account outcomes assessment report. This has been in our bills the last several years with no changes really. Uh, section six is from the governor's bill last, policy bill last uh, session. Uh, dealing with providing uh, a statute that would allow 
or would not allow discrimination for teachers based on teaching about uh, persons from protected classes. Section seven is the state model policy that was also in the governor's bill last session that would strengthen uh, the requirement for MDE to have resources for creating for schools to help them create positive school climates and reduce discrimination. Sections eight through 10 focus on licensure rules and testing. Sections 11 through 13 focus on a come teach in Minnesota hiring and retention bonus program that we're proposing. Section 14 and 15 relate to some minor modifications to the collaborative urban and greater Minnesota educators of color program that's existed for several years. Section 16 would make like we had in our proposal last year and the year before uh, grants for grow your own programs part of statute with an expanded types of grow your own programs available for adults who don't have bachelor's degrees as well as for secondary school students. Section 17 focuses on some modifications to the teacher mentorship and retention grant program that was established in 2019 based on the experiences of administering that grant program over the last couple of years. Principal, uh, the section 18 is regarding principal evaluation that principals must have culturally responsive skills and practices. This was part of the governor's bill last session, as was section 19 addressing graduation ceremonies and the rights of Native American students to wear their tribal regalia. Section 20 is amendments to the achievement and integration program, uh, building upon those proposals in 2020, requiring districts to address systemic inequities. And then we have an appropriation section, which is not part of the purview of this committee. I will take questions after uh, testifiers as you or anybody else seems uh, relevant to ask. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Spies. Uh, Vice Chair Hassan, would you like to introduce your next testifier? Yes, Madam Chair. Um, I believe the next testifier is uh, the Teacher of the Year, Minnesota Teacher of the Year, Korsha Hassan. Salam, peace to you all. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, and members of the committee. My name is Kosha Hassan. I'm a fourth grade teacher at Echo Park Elementary School in the Rosemont, Apple Valley, and Egan School District. I'm currently in my ninth year of teaching and I'm the 2020 Minnesota Teacher of the Year. I've also never been tenured. I say this to make a point because not only am I the Teacher of the Year, but I'm also pretty damn good at what I do. However, despite being a finalist for Minnesota's Teacher of the Year last spring, I was laid off in the Burnsville Egan Savage School District. Then I went on to win the honor. I'm the poster child for why last in first out policies are inequitable and racist and why more districts and local unions need to negotiate policies as allowed in the current statute, statute to retain teachers of color who don't have seniority. I knew the moment I became a teacher that it was my calling. There was this energy that buzzed in the air when I worked with students, but particularly black students. I remember my first week at an early childhood center where I work with emerging readers. I knew then that I connected deeply and differently with my students than my white peers. I knew what it was like to face food insecurity. I knew what it was like to force to be forced to hide internalized trauma. And I especially knew what it was like to not be understood by my teachers. One student of mine came up to me after I finished a reading lesson and whispered in my ear, you make me feel like power. She was four years old. I knew then, like I know now, the power I can give to my students. Teaching is an act of radical love. And for BIPOC educators, we carry a special kind of love. The kind of love that ensures our students thrive in all circumstances. The kind of love that advocates loudly for equity and anti-racism to be action items, not buzzwords. BIPOC educators have the kind of love that ensures their students of color aren't marginalized in the, in the education system like they were. I choose to teach elementary students and I'm a fourth grade teacher because of their joy, hope and imagination. They flourish when they're able to be their authentic selves and are valued for who they are. 
When black and brown children no longer express interest in their learning and lose self-confidence, it is largely due to the fact that they aren't being equitably, equitably served in their learning spaces. The fourth grade failure syndrome isn't caused by accident. This system is designed to have a cumulative effect of cultural insensitivity, disproportionately harsh discipline and lower teacher expectations for kids of color. As a black educator, I deeply analyze and push back on exclusionary practices in school policies, curriculum, classroom practices, and parent engagement. Students who are labeled deviant, a problem, and disrespectful show up differently in my classroom because I'm able to address their needs and see them without those labels. Two years ago, I taught a fifth grader who had chronic behavioral problems throughout elementary school. He was constantly seen as a threatening black man instead of a child who needed unconditional love and encouragement. In my classroom, he not only showed his vulnerability, but displayed academic and social emotional progress. He was able to be his authentic self without fear of being ridiculed, punished, or harmed by his teacher. He grew to love reading and began to use spoken word to express his feelings about the world. BIPOC educators teach the truth, even when we pay hell for it. Last summer, we all witnessed a protest against police violence in the wake of George Floyd's murder. It was a perfect opportunity to pause and reflect amidst the uprising and the pandemic that more must be done toward a more perfect union, union as stated in the Constitution. I took this opportunity, like many other educators, to discuss systemic racism and the role of white supremacy in our country's inception and current state. This past fall, I read something, in our, something Happened in Our Town, a book about racial injustice to my students. When I was criticized very publicly about my choice to use this book, my school administrators let me face the backlash alone. Passing this bill will hold administrators accountable for being culturally responsive and require school boards to have policy that prohibits discrimination or dis discipline for a teacher on the basis of incorporating into curriculum contributions by persons of protected class. I believe the work to make our country a more racially just place should begin in our schools, and this bill will help make that happen. As a Black educator, I'm able to validate my students' lived experiences so they all feel seen. I address this issue in my school district and state as a teacher of color who is determined to promote equity no matter the cost. I've been to too many professional development spaces where discussion of implicit biases were used as a band-aid for structural racism. We need systemic policy change to address the severe and persistent shortage of teachers of color. All students deserve and benefit from diverse teachers. We need school systems that support and uplift our teachers of color so our students of color can then see themselves as valued and, and impactful teachers of color one day. The 2021 Increased Teachers of Color Act is a transformative systemic change. We need to increase the percentage of teachers of color and American Indian teachers in Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hassan, for your uh, testimony and congratulations on being Teacher of the Year. Um, Vice Chair Hassan, would you like to introduce your next uh, testifier, please? Thank you, Madam Chair. And our next testifier is uh, Minnesota Teacher of the Year of 2019, Jess Davis. Thank you, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, Ranking Member, members of the committee. I am Jessica Davis. I'm grateful to have another opportunity to confront the vast inequities in Minnesota's public education and testify on behalf of the Increased Teachers of Color Act. In review, I began teaching high school mathematics in 2006, and it was during my time at South St. Paul's Secondary that I was honored as Minnesota's Teacher of the Year for 2019-2020. Some know that I am a Minnesota native, the daughter of educators, a graduate of public school, hold a bachelor and master's degree from two of Minnesota's finest institutions. And yet, as a biracial black and white female in the field of STEM, I have never had a teacher who looks like me. I've thought a lot about that over the last year. I believe that the student and teacher experiences are connected and that we as teachers are not only responsible for educating future adults, but nurturing a love for learning that inspires the next generation of educators. Given our current realities, I wonder, have we done this? What are we willing to change in order to recenter the margins and bring life to the lip service? 
How do we hold one another accountable so that the heavy lifting of this work is not laid solely at the feet of teachers of color, but where excellence is demanded of everyone and mediocrity is acceptable for no one? What comes up for you when I voice those wonders? During my own struggle through distance learning last spring, I began to question how I personally have contributed to a system centered in whiteness or exacerbated inequities and even prioritized completion over critical consciousness and cultural competency. By the time my South Minneapolis neighborhood was in flames last summer, I confess, the majority of my time was no longer focused on mathematics or essential standards, but spent with my students processing what they were living. I listened to my students' fears and frustrations and attempted to offer kinship through my own experience as a student near their own ages during the Rodney King trial of the 90s. And it was then that one of my dear kids looked straight into my soul through a camera and wondered, if you've been through this before, then why didn't you do something? It was in that moment that I realized I was unwilling to normalize for my students the tokenization that I was experiencing as the only black teacher in a district for almost a decade. My exhaustion was not their burden to carry. So I resigned. And now there's one less teacher of color in the classroom. That burden is on all of us, namely the adults who have lived through it and know better. It is on us to disrupt the systems of status quo, to invest in practices that not only recruit but retain staff that represent the diverse student population. But most of all, it's on us to demand that all teachers are qualified to meet the unique needs of student populations, including white staff. Intersections of oppression may not yet be quantifiable, but the impact is exponential. I was physically reminded of the way my brown body keeps score when just a week after my decision to leave the classroom, I was diagnosed with cancer. And once again, I considered what my students were witnessing and what they would infer and carry with them about what it means to be black, brown, or indigenous in America. We must agree that the work of creating anti-racist, equitable learning experiences for all kids is not about checking a box, nor is it an optional practice that one can opt out. It will take all of us individually unpacking our own truths and how we got here and collectively grappling with the discomfort that comes with our students asking us, why haven't we done something about it? I now serve as a racial equity instructional coach in St. Louis Park Schools, where I get to support other teachers at building their own capacity to grow as critically conscious and culturally relevant educators. I'm learning that implementing strategies which validate, affirm, embrace, and integrate culture and community strengths cannot be done alone or in isolation, nor can it be left to the bodies of color. I have witnessed the power of protocol and common language that names the practices that institutionalize racism in our school. But most importantly, I have heard our stu students confirm that they want teachers who want to do this work. The student leaders that I've gotten to work with this year have reminded me that they and history are always watching and we adults are always teaching regardless of classroom or title. Our kids are consuming the actions taking place around them and our at our buildings of government and listening to the words of our leaders and our elected officials. So it is on us to remain mindful that how we model our priorities now determines whether these students will grow up to scale the walls of the Capitol building or give truth to power through poetry inside of it at a historical inaugurations. We've done the research, we have the data, I believe we've exhausted the conversation. So I wonder, what will it take for this to be our last generation of kids who asks of the adults, why didn't you do something about it? Indeed, thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Davis, for your, your testimony. Uh, Vice Chair Hassan, I believe you have one more uh, testifier. Yes, Madam Chair, and uh, <clears throat> the next test Fire is Salma Abdi, uh, 11th grader from Register Century High School and also a member of Minnesota Youth Council. Thank you, Representative Hassan, and um, thank you, Representative Richardson and fellow committee members. My name is Salma Abdi, and I'm an 11th grader at Rochester Century High School, and I'm on the Minnesota Youth Council as a Congressional District 1 representative. See, I've been going to school for over 13 years. 
accounting for preschool and kindergarten. In those years, I have only had four teachers of color. And when you compare that with the diversity of the student body, it's an extremely uneven ratio. The issue with not seeing your teachers represent you in a space that is supposed to be safe is that as much as my white teachers care, 90% don't understand my experiences in a predominantly white space. And they can't understand how traumatizing microaggressive and racist comments are. See, when you're the only student of color in a classroom and someone says something racist, you not only have to simultaneously teach them why that what they said is problematic, but also have to internally digest how that person not only had the audacity to say it, but will likely never face repercussions. See, I could sit here for over an hour about all the racist things said to me and about other racial groups by teachers not even getting into students, yet we are asked to trust school administrators and leaders who don't understand our concerns. And when we do trust them, we get answers like, your concern was addressed and we are moving forward. Which by the way, is a direct quote from an email I got from an administrator after telling him about my experience with a racist coach. They never told me what they did to remedy that situation a situation that not only made me feel uncomfortable and unsafe, and it has been months and I still don't know what happened. That's why adding the phrase anti-racist to this bill is highly important because in an education setting, we cannot be passive in combating individual or systemic racism. If our teachers represented our student body, we could have we could deep dig deeper and have more engaging conversations with more teachers. We could be more enthusiastic about subjects we aren't very fond of. For example, when I was in middle school, I had a math teacher who was black. And I can say, looking back at it, he's the biggest reason I'm good at math, which, by the way, I do not like. He would always talk about math in the context of things that made sense to us. And he never let us drown in misery or anxiety in his class. He pushed us to make sure we reached our potential and pushed us even further. For example, I started high school math in a 10th grade honors class. And now as a junior, I take a pre-calculus class at my local community college. Looking back now, if I ever thought of becoming a teacher, Mr. Kahinde would have been the reason. I remember everything he taught me, even though I didn't like math. I know what it's like to think about the teaching profession and think it was inspirational. However, I'm not so sure sometimes now. So while I won't become a teacher, there are so many students of color who would excel as teachers, but school isn't a great experience for us. Forgetting the typical high school experience. So, so many people don't want to become teachers. That's why if we want more teachers of color teaching, an education should not bring forth trauma and something we want to wipe from our memory. It should not be a reason people don't follow their calling. That's why it's essential to pass this bill because it's not only meant to do un undo the systemic racism in education, but be an investment for the future because education is the groundwork. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Abdi, for your uh, testimony today. We appreciate having a chance to hear from you. Uh, we're now going to move on to public testimony. I will note that we currently have uh, we that we have uh, 15 people who have signed up to uh, testify. Uh, our first uh, four testifiers are from our uh, councils, and they are going to be testifying together for a combined total of three minutes. And then we're uh, just going to remind all other uh, testifiers that they have uh, two minutes for uh, public comments. And if you're not able to get through all of your comments, you can always submit things in writing um, as well uh, after uh, today's um, after today's uh, hearing. So with that, we will um, uh, jump into uh, the first four uh, testifiers from the councils. And uh, first up, it looks like the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council, uh, Sh uh, Shannon Geshek. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> and Andrew Morris will be on deck. Thank you. Please proceed. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, Richardson and members. My name is Shannon Gijek. I am a citizen of this great state of Minnesota, as well as a citizen of the Boys Fort Band of Chippewa. And I serve as the executive director at the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council. As our councils have done every year since 2017, we are here to share a united message from the three state ethnic councils and the Indian Affairs Council in strong support of the Increased Teachers of Color Act House File 217 as our top joint priority in education. As you heard from the Pelsby presentation, there continues to be a wide gap between the percentage of students of color and American Indian students and the percentage of teachers of color and American Indian teachers. Addressing this severe shortage is key to narrowing our state's persistent opportunity and achievement gaps, which disproportionately impact our constituent communities and our tribal nations. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Andrew Morris with the Council on Asian Pacific uh, Minnesotans and uh, Samantha Diaz is on deck. And thank you, Madam Chair and members. My name is Andy Morris and I serve as the Public Affairs and Legislative Liaison with the Council on Asian Pacific Minnesotans. Like previous iterations of this bill, House File 217 will strengthen policy to help ensure a greater return on state investments and address systemic barriers to recruiting, preparing, and retaining teachers of color and American Indian teachers. We are pleased that dozens of education organizations have expressed their endorsement of this bill, despite having strong disagreements on other pieces of legislation and policy. We also look forward to continue dialogue with members of both parties in both the House and the Senate to substantively address our state's chronic teacher of color and American Indian teacher shortage which will help efforts to close opportunity gaps that exist for students in our communities. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, up next, we have uh, Samantha Diaz with the Minnesota Council on Latino Affairs and Theo Rose uh, is on deck. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. My name is Samantha Diaz and I serve as the Legislative and Policy Director at the Minnesota Council on Latino Affairs. The councils, our communities, the coalition, have a sense of urgency on this issue as our students' learning continues to be impeded by structural and systemic challenges that have only been exacerbated by the pandemic. Vitally important policy language in this bill would require districts and charter schools to have plans to ensure that curriculum is rigorous, accurate, anti-racist, and culturally sustaining, and that learning and work, environment, work environments validate, embrace, affirm, and integrate the cultural and community strengths for all students, families, and employees. These strengthened plans will be critical in addressing the wide ranging impact that COVID-19 has disproportionately inflicted on our students' learning. Thank you, Ms. Diaz. Uh, up next from the Council on Minnesotans of African Heritage, Theo Rose. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. My name is Theodore Rose and I serve as Legislative and Policy Director at the Council for Minnesotans of African Heritage. Research clearly demonstrates that all students, including students of color and American Indian students benefit from diverse teachers. Our communities are calling for legislation that advances educational excellence, workforce productivity, and also responds to the dynamic needs of our students. We appreciate Chair Richardson's leadership in prioritizing the hearing of this bill and Representative Hassan's leadership in serving as his lead author. We strongly recommend that your committee fully support all the policy language in the 2021 Increased Teachers of Color Act. Thank you for your leadership and doing what is right for all students in Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Up next from the Minnesota Department of Education, we have Adosh Huni. Madam Chair, members, thank you. My name is Ado Shuni. I'm the Director of Government Relations at the Department of Education here. And thank you for the opportunity to testify on Representative Hassan's HF 217. And thank you to the author for carrying this bill. Also, thank you to the coalition for their long work in this space and bringing this proposal to fruition again this year um, with, its, with its additions. They've been great partners with the department and working on policies to create a more inclusive and 
culturally sustaining teaching and learning environment and diversifying the teacher workforce. I'm coming to the committee today to express MDE's support for much of this work and I'll, I'll keep my comments limited to the policy provisions. So we strongly support the provisions that directly seek to create uh, school environments that are culturally responsive, inclusive, and respectful for all students, staff, families, and communities. This bill especially sets strong expectations about meeting the needs of historically marginalized groups. Communities of color, indigenous communities, and other marginalized groups clearly emphasize that schools are not necessarily culturally responsive and inclusive spaces for students, staff, and families. And this has a direct impact on how people experience the school system, as well as pervasive achievement and opportunity gaps. But by revising state statutes on the world's best workforce, development evaluation and achievement and integration to pursue culturally responsive and inclusive practices and culturally sustaining practices in our education system, this bill, this bill really elevates the urgency and importance of this issue as a key strategy to support all of our children, regardless of race or zip code. We also appreciate that this bill sets strong goals for increasing and diversifying the teacher workforce and ensures that all students have access to effective teachers who reflect the diversity of our students. Um, additionally, we appreciate the expansion of Grow Your Own program. This will lead to more opportunities for applicants and uh, to diversify the teacher workforce. And finally, we really appreciate the author including other provisions from the governor's policy bill last year, including the provision, prohibition of educator discipline for uh, curriculum on contributions of people from historically marginalized communities and allowing American Indians to uh, American Indian students to wear items of cultural significance in graduation ceremonies. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, up next, we have uh, Sylvia Jumsun DeShazo, uh, a student with uh, Southwest High School in Minneapolis. And on deck, we have Yayana Maccabee. Madam Chair and members, my name is Silvio Johnson DeShazo, and I'm a junior at Southwest High School of Minneapolis. This bill is important because at a young age, I experienced racism and discrimination because of my color and identity, which was very tough for me to handle by myself. So having a teacher of color be there to help me confront racism was very helpful. Another major reason why I support this bill is because it defines ethnic studies in section one and in section two. It would require that all students be provided access to ethnic studies. I am involved in Youth Ethnic Studies Coalition and a few other youth groups. Ethnic studies has impacted me by really understanding another culture and their history deeply and that of better understanding my peers. But I wish I learned more about my own culture and background as well. The reason why I have not learned about my own cultural background and history, as well as many others, is because except for two experiences in middle school, all I've been taught is about white history. Ethnic studies empowers youth and adults with knowledge about various racial ethnic groups and how those groups have struggled against systemic racism. Those of us in our coalition of youth for ethnic studies are tired and mentally drained of the racism and discrimination we face that we see within our education system. One thing we hear sometimes is this country was not an inherently racist country. However, the historical fact is racism is what developed this country. Native Americans were discriminated against, killed, their land taken away from them. Slavery of Africans was based off of racism and was also how this country was built for 246 years until the Civil War. Some people don't also understand the privileges that they have because they don't understand the multicultural history of our country. They don't have to experience racism like most people of color do. They don't understand how hard it was and still is to fight for the opportunity for people of color. Okay fight for respect, the fight to be equal, and the fight to live. I don't dislike this country. I appreciate it. We can't truly understand American history without having ethnic studies. Racism is not going to go away, but if people had a better understanding of it and a better understanding of each other, then we could have less racism. Having ethnic studies would bring us together with more mutual understanding of everyone's contributions and part in history. I want everyone to understand the full truth about the history of America. I want people like my younger cousins to be given the opportunity that I didn't fully have. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Up next, we have Johanna Mac, uh, uh with Washburn High School in Minneapolis. Can you all hear me all right? Can you guys hear me okay? Yes, we are able to hear you. Thank you. Madam Chair and members, my name is Johanna Macby. I'm currently a junior at Washburn High School. I've had two teachers of color in my entire schooling career, one in middle school and one in high school. Growing up with brown skin in a society where everything revolves around whiteness, even your education, is damaging, confusing, and traumatizing. I remember when I was seven years old, I had grown to hate my skin and body with every inch of my soul, partly because of my experiences at school. 
And then came the phase that many Black children go through. Then came the question my mom hoped she'd never have to hear from me. Is there a way to lighten my skin, like bleach? My mom talked about an imaginary procedure. She talked about it like it was the most painful thing to ever experience, and that it's really not worth it. That my skin was beautiful just the way it was. And of course, I believed her. But still, there was this feeling of estrangement. That feeling has stayed with me till this day. At school, I know I don't belong. How could I belong when my ancestors' existence in history books is short and brief, when my peers are surprised at how eloquently I speak, for when a teacher who looks like me teaching AP is rare, when a student looks like me taking IB is rare, when having darker skin makes you both invisible and a target at the same time in a space full of white students, when you're expected to fail, so don't even try, when they assume your capability is lower and theirs higher, when your humanity is questioned. Passing this bill to increase teachers of color shouldn't be in speculation. Everything proposed is a necessity long overdue. A bill centered around love, healing, and community shouldn't create controversy. I know that passing this bill will not only begin systemic change, but also internal emotional change within students. I know that if seven-year-old me would have had a teacher of color to look up to, maybe she would have looked in the mirror and seen beauty, and maybe she would have seen a future educator. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Um, up next, we have Anne Kraft Heffer, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, a retired teacher with the Duluth Public Schools um, and also a classroom uh, teacher uh, between, um, uh, well, I'll, I'll just let you introduce yourself, Anne. Thank you very much. I'm assuming you can hear me? I can hear you, yes. All right. Thank you, legislators and staff, for the work you do to represent your constituents. I was a teacher for almost 40 years and on Pelsby, on Board of Teaching before that, heavily involved in the union. For over 30 years, I've been aware of the lack of people of color and indigenous people in our teaching staff in Minnesota. The leadership groups I was part of tried to address the need this creates in our classroom. We've listened to communities of color, and this legislation addresses many of the barriers that are identified by those people. There's both an art and a science to teaching, and part of the art is being able to see things through the lens of your students. Teaching is about relationship. Positive relationship is most easily built when we're open to learning from each other and willing to listen and positively respond to differences. Sorry, I lost my spot. The turbulence of the last year has been even more pointedly revealing the current state of inequity and unrest in our communities. It's my belief that education is a key component to overcoming some aspects of these concerns. This bill addresses some of the concerns I've heard from people of color and those living in poverty. This bill has language addressing the need for grow your own programs. We have pathways to teaching in Duluth, a para cohort program, or there are several of them in the cities, financial and institutional assistance for teacher candidates, testing accommodations in the form of untimed tests, a cap on testing fees, improvements in mentorship curriculum and school climate, and other barriers that people of color are trying to get through as they go through the rigor of teacher prep. Our schools need you to help build the bridges and the pathways to assure that we have highly qualified teachers who reflect the cultural composition of our communities. If the needs of each child is at the core of planning the future of education and our workforce, then we owe it to each child to assure that their education prepares them to understand their world. HF 217 will help to create the future that we want for each child in Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Up next, we have uh, Laura Mackey, um, Assistant Professor uh, with uh, Minnesota State University. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Dr. Laura Mackey. I'm a faculty member at Minnesota State University, Mankato, where I serve as the Director of Assessment and Research for the College of Education. I come before you today to ask for your support for HF 217. While I support the entire bill, I am here today because I especially support the changes to the standardized testing requirements in Section 10. The 2017 legislature under Republican leadership made progress by eliminating the so-called basic skills exam requirements for tier three licensure. 
since then, districts have not expressed widespread concern that new teachers are any less qualified to teach. However, expensive and onerous content and pedagogy licensure exam requirements continue to prevent thousands of competent white teacher candidates, indigenous teacher candidates, and teacher candidates of color from entering teacher preparation programs and from becoming fully licensed teachers. According to the 2019-2020 Minnesota Teacher Licensing Exam Technical Report, nearly 3,300 total candidates did not pass one or more exams, including more than 2,200 white candidates and nearly 950 indigenous candidates and candidates of color. These requirements disproportionately affect teacher candidates of color for whom pass rates on the content exams range from 47 to 75%. Moreover, the exams do not have any predictive validity. That is, they cannot provide any information about how well prepared someone is to teach or how effective they may be as a teacher. Our candidates at Minnesota State University Mankato and all other candidates throughout the state must meet hundreds of licensure standards through coursework and field experiences in both content and pedagogy to complete our programs. Multiple choice tests are not an accurate indicator of ability to work with students mm -hmm. and only create barriers for teacher candidates. If we are truly committed to increasing the number of teachers of color in Minnesota K-12 classrooms, we must eliminate these exam requirements. Please support HF 217, thank you. Thank you for your testimony, uh, Dr. Mackey. Uh, up next, we have Rizzo Agatone House, uh, an eighth grade student from Cloquet Middle School. Hello, Hello, Madam Chair Richardson and members of the House Education Policy Committee. Good afternoon. My name is Rizal Agatone House. I am in eighth grade and I go to Cloquet Middle School. I also reside in Fond du Lac, Northern Minnesota. Something interesting about my education I had three Ojibwe teachers in my elementary experience, my kindergarten, second, and third grade teachers, that is. They were kind and forgiving, maybe one of the most important skills a teacher could have to me, the latter. I learned from them, and more than I think I would have without them. We discovered our required things, including math, reading, English, etc. But I also got to learn about my Ojibwe ancestors and what they did, and that's something that's not taught very often. And that's just one example of what I gained from three teachers just being Ojibwe. I can guarantee all of you somewhere out there right now, there is a person who could be a perfect teacher and give a kid or a class an education to light up their purposes. They could give their students a home like how my teachers did. But because that person who could become a teacher is a person of color, they'll never know how. They'll never get the chance to help that kid struggling through school and life. I believe that could change. I think that the Increased Teachers of Color Act could help that person out there with the gift of teaching. And I believe that one day a kid could find a home in a classroom like I did. Thank you all for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, up next, we have uh, Daisy Hernandez uh, Begarina, uh, a student with uh, Gustavus. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members. My name, as you just said, is Daisy Hernandez Barriarena. I'm in sociology and anthropology student at Gustavus in St. Peter. It wasn't until I attended PSEO courses in my hometown of Austin, Minnesota, that I was able to receive a blurb of what our history really is. I took a class with a professor whose main text was Howard Zinn's A People's History of the United States. While the book is not perfect, it did introduce me to a version of the United States I had never really heard of before. A version that gave validation to my lived experience as a Latina woman and first generation American. I love my country, but in order to achieve what President Biden encourages us to work for, a more perfect union, it is necessary for our future generations to receive competent and truthful historical accounts. Ethnic studies as described in HF 217 is the way to do this. While my time has passed, I'm here on behalf of my younger sibling, my nieces and nephews, and others who will be the backbone of our nation sooner than we realize. A 2016 study by the Stanford Graduate School of Education showed that ethnic studies courses increase attendance and academic performance. School districts must have strategic plans to provide all students with access to competent ethnic studies. A federal report from the Bank of Minneapolis concluded that Minnesota is one of the worst states for education achievement gaps. Increasing BIPOC educators is one way we can begin to change this. 
I urge you to see the value in this bill as a means to be honest with ourselves and as a way to begin to close the achievement gaps in our state. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony today. Uh, up next, we have Daisy Molina from El Calijo, uh, an El Calijo student um, uh, in 12th grade. You are up. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, Madam Chair Richardson and everyone else on the Education Policy Committee. My name is Daisy Molina and I'm a senior at El Calijo High School. I'm here to support the, the proposed policy to increase Teachers of Color Act. I believe that students can relate and feel comfortable with their teachers and staff that look like them and know their culture. They are able to understand and communicate with us students on a different level. Having teachers of color can motivate students to achieve bigger things in life when they see themselves reflected in people of color that have made it. It gives kids hope with their own education and dreams. I personally can share that when it came when it came to a colegio, I had teachers of color who were affirming and validating who I am. It helped me really come. It made me really comfortable. I was very shy at first, and teachers like Miss Graciela helped me a lot because she understood my background and allowed me to open up. Once I felt the confidence in myself, I have been able to achieve, learn, to active learn in my class. I am able to talk to school staff about things that I could be different or that we can do better. I feel like my voice is heard. Being in the colegio gave me hope and made me realize that being a woman of color, I can get to place and do things that I want to do. I hope to be an automotive mechanic and I am proud to say that I have been accepted into three colleges and I'm still applying for more. That was possible because teachers of color in my school that pushed me to be the best of myself. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony today. Uh, and. Last up, we have Cole Stevens, a 2020 graduate of Roosevelt High School in Minneapolis. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, Madam and Chair members, or uh, Madam Chair and members, my name is Cole Stevens, and uh, all within the last year, I've graduated, having gone to three different high schools in Southside Minneapolis. I've co-founded and acted as the uh, program director of Bridge Makers, a youth advocacy organization, mobilizing youth story as uh, tools for change. And finally, I've taken a position with a new North Minneapolis startup charter school, uh, Exploration High School. Despite all of this, I can only count all of the teachers of color I've had on one hand. If I were to count all of the teachers of color I've had the uh, 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 experience to work with, it barely forced me to use my second hand. This experience is not unique to me. My work with Bridgemakers has included dozens of online discussions engaging hundreds of students statewide, um, and most recently a bipartisan panel of legislators and thought leaders to develop our education policy agenda in collaboration with Youth Prize. Out of these many discussions, we saw a powerful theme that carried over county lines. Uh, young people are inspired by leadership and mentorship from people that look like them and have had similar life experiences, and that a diversity of influential perspectives is critical for a child's development uh, in the areas of compassion, critical thinking, and their communication skills. Having heard the students' stories and graduating from Roosevelt High School myself, uh, where 77% of the students were non-white and only two teachers of color shared the halls with us, I can safely say that we are lacking that critical diversity of perspectives in our schools today. So on behalf of all Minnesota students who yearn for teachers and curriculum that reflect their diverse backgrounds, the parents struggling to understand why their kids are not engaged, and the businesses that need creative thinkers and problem solvers, um, I urge you to support House File 217 in its current form. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, it looks like we have some hands that are up, so we'll move into questions at this point. Representative Scott. Uh, th thank you, Madam Chair, and um, thank you for uh, a good hearing today. And I think um, I think we would most everybody on this call would agree that um, that we do need more teachers of color in the classrooms. And so, thank you for um, the discussion. Um, one of my questions, and I maybe this is for the bill author because um, uh, it directs right to the bill. Let me switch to the. Um, bill language. Um, on line 2.9, um, there's a definition for rigorous there, and it says uh, uh, it means uh, meeting state K-12 academic standards. And I just um, wondered why um, that was the definition chosen for rigorous. 
Uh, Vice Chair Hassan or Dr. Uh, Spies, um, which one of you would like to take that? Madam Chair, I'll let uh, Dr. Spies take it. Madam Chair, Representative, that's a good question. We thought that would be the least controversial definition of rigor, uh, that the standards, the K-12 standards in the state are built with the presupposition that they will be rigorous. That's their charge. Uh, that's why they exist. Uh, thank you. And I just got, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And so, I don't know, just, you know, because um, we also know that uh, students of color are less likely to be in honors classes, in college in the classroom, and those sorts of things. Um, I just feel like that that definition is not, it's not good enough um, for rigorous, uh, the definition of rigorous. I think rigorous means going above and beyond the standards. And um, I just, I don't want to, as some of these students in their testimony said, I. Um, I believe it was one of the young women. Um, we don't need to be lowering expectations. We need to be raising expectations. And so I just, I, um, you know, many parts of this bill I agree with, some that I don't, and that's one of them that I do not agree with. I, I think that we need to raise the bar, not lower it. And just having the definition of the word rigorous mean this meeting the state standards is is not good enough. Um, so I would love to see that part changed and let's raise the bar. Thank you. Thank you, Representative uh, Scott. And um, sorry, uh, Dr. Spies for um, mispronouncing your name. Uh, up next, we have Representative Frazier. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I, I'll, I'll be quick. And it's just a comment. I, I, I didn't want to let this moment pass without me saying um, all the presenters were great, but, but to our young people that presented today, um, you touched me in a way that I just had to say thank you for being brave, um, for being fearless, and for stepping up and speaking to us adults and letting us know what you need to be successful. I always see this role that I'm in, and I hope my other legislative colleagues see it as well, as we are, we are mere, um, uh, just holding a space and trying to make sure that we're good stewards to create a, a society in a state that is gonna be conducive to what you all need and what you all can thrive in, um, in the future. So I don't know how anyone could hear what our young people said they need to be successful in this, in this space and not wanna do everything we can to make sure it happens. Um, this, this bill has provisions in it that will create those spaces that will allow for teachers of color to bring their entire selves to the classroom and to be who they are and to um, aid in the success of our students that not only look like them, but look like everyone else in the state. So I, I, I encourage all of us to, to make sure that we really heard, not just listen to, but we really heard what our young people said today about what they need, what they need to be successful. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well said, Representative Frazier. Uh, Representative Jordan. Thank you, Madam Chair. And my question is for Ms. Obge or, or any of the other students, but. Ms. Abdi, um, I've had the uh, pleasure of hearing you testify in other committees before about um, your, uh, your experiences learning through distance learning and hybrid learning. Is there any way you could talk a little bit about what you think this bill and its provisions around increasing educators of color and increasing um, ethnic studies and other culturally competent opportunities would have had um, on your learning experiences during the pandemic? Ms. Abdi. Uh, thank you, Representative Jordan and Rep um, Representative Richardson. Um, I really think, um, so the pandemic, not only was the pandemic happening, a lot of things happened in our state, including the murder of George Floyd and the uprising. Um, so having teachers of color during that time would have been really essential. Um, an experience that keeps on coming to mind when I think about that is um, during that time period, I was taking a chemistry honors class and I had an 89.67% in the class, which is 0.33% away from an A. If you rounded up, that would have been an A. However, um, after I asked my teacher and told him, it was like, there's a lot of things going on. He kind of, he said he wouldn't do it. So it, one, one, it brought down my GPA, but two, it was kind of an experience where 
I couldn't really talk about what was going on without it seeming controversial. I couldn't digest my experiences in the classroom because we still have to do our homework, do take our tests. And like, there's so many things going on and you can't really digest that in an education setting, even though it does affect so many students. Um, having teachers of color would have helped um, kind of talking about this issues. What are your thoughts? What has previously happened? What can we do now as students? Because I know there are so many students at my school, not just students of color, who were worried, who were wondering what was going on and what they could do to help. So having ethnic studies that was taught by, uh, that's taught by a teacher of color it would have been essential and important. Um, this year is my first year, that is the first year my school district has ever had an ethnic studies class. I mean, I've yet to take it hopefully next year, but it would have been amazing to have a, a teacher of color then. Thank you, Ms. Abby, for your um, for that comment. So we are at 2.15, um, and so we will move to the uh, delete everything amendment that is before us. Uh, Representative Erickson, did you want to move the DE1 amendment? Thank you, Madam Chair. This is Representative Erickson. I move the H0217 DE1 amendment and request a roll call. Thank you. So, um, would you Oh, please speak to the amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. And first, I want to say to the students that I appreciated your testimony very much and remind you that in our teacher code of ethics, which I uh, abided by for nearly 40 years, teachers are called on to respect all their students, regardless of how they come to them. So this DE amendment, members, uh, I'm speaking on behalf of Representative Damon, the chief author, and my team uh, here in uh, at policy. But our goal is to keep teachers of color and American Indian teachers in the classroom. It is also to, uh, to ensure that there are other ways to become a highly effective, highly qualified teacher uh, than going through a teacher prep program that is traditional. There are multiple pathways. And finally, uh, I believe and we believe that this DE amendment is a serious effort to plug the holes that force teachers of color and American Indian teachers out of the classroom. And we heard that example testified by one of our former teachers of the year. So to walk through the uh, uh, delete all quickly, uh, the first section defines the professional license. We believe that uh, tiers one and two are valid licenses, and therefore those teachers who uh, uh, earn those licenses are also professionals. In the next section, we repeal the current law requirements for schools to post and try to hire a tier two, three, or four licensed teacher before hiring a tier one, because that tier one might be the answer to increasing the teachers of color or American Indians in the classroom. In the next section, we prohibit the use of seniority in the hiring or dismissal of a teacher and require districts to report all new teacher hires and terminations, including layoffs by race and ethnicity. Next, we prohibit the prioritizing of tier one and two teachers for unrequested leaves of absence. That often happens and that removes our teachers of color or American Indian teachers from the classroom. The next section, districts with teacher mentoring or retention programs, we're asking them to negotiate additional retention strategies and protection from layoffs in the beginning years of employment for teachers of color and American Indians. The current law limits this requirement only to school districts receiving a mentoring grant. Next, we expand the Collaborative Urban and, and Greater Minnesota Education of Color Grant Program. Representative Fraser, I, I uh, salute you for supporting this program in the past and uh, want you to know that I was one of the uh, original supporters and authors of this a long time ago, and we're awaiting an audit report on it too, which I hope will be very positive. But we expand that program to assist teacher candidates to a, obtain a tier one or two license. And we, because uh, current law only provides for tier three, and we would also uh, in that uh, grant expand the use of alternative teacher preparation programs uh, and, and the grants would go toward that. And finally, uh, we expand the paraprofessional pathway to teacher licensure through Grow Your Own programs. It's a grant program to include alternative teacher preparation programs when current law limits grants to non-conventional programs 
which are higher education institution based. So Madam Chair, with that, uh, this is uh, our delete all amendment, which we think will really uh, be a better way to get uh, teachers of color and American Indian candidates into our programs and into our classrooms uh, to help those students who testified to know that we do honor the fact that teachers respect all of you. Thank you, Representative Erickson. Um, Vice Chair Hassan. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, uh, Representative Erickson, for this uh, amendment. Um, I wish you would have reached out to me. I see uh, several provisions of this amendment um, being useful to include in the bill, but at this time, I respectfully um, would say that I, I would not accept this delete all amendment, and I ask members to vote no, but I'm open to the idea of working with you offline before this bill uh, goes to education finance. I've also reached out to Rep. Dema to just work with her on some of the provisions in this bill, but I wouldn't accept this uh, amendment at this time. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair uh, Hassan. Um, so we are, uh, are just past uh, 220, so we will move to a roll call on the DE1 uh, amendment. Um, Ms. Larson, can you please uh, take the roll on the amendment? Chair Richardson? No. Vice Chair Hassan? No. Representative Erickson? Yes. <laughs> Representative Driskowski? Yes. Representative Bennett? Yes. Representative Berg? No. Representative Bo? Yes. Representative Christensen? No. Representative Edelson? No. Representative Feist? No. Representative Frazier? No. Representative Jordan? No. Representative Keeler? No. Representative Moeller? No. Representative Mueller? Yes. Representative Poston? Yes. Representative Scott? Aye. Representative Erdl, excused. Representative Waslowick? No. So the motion does not carry and the amendment is not uh, adopted. Um, I did notice uh, prior to going to the amendment discussion, uh, Representative Berg, you had your hand raised. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. I was just going to uh, comment how moving the testimony from our young people was. I agree with uh, Representative um, Frazier on his remarks. Also. Um, prior to being sworn in, but after I'd won the election, my community asked me to um, take a position on what had happened um, uh, to Korsha, Teacher of the Year, um, and I met with the leadership of the school district, of which I have just a couple of schools in my district, and um, it was a reasonable meeting, but I just wanted to point out that it's incumbent on those of us in any type of type of position of power and those of us that are allies to lift up these voices, support where we have an opportunity to do so. I just wanted to express that I think this bill does just that and it's an honor to be a part of this discussion. Thank you and thank you to our uh, young testifiers. Thank you, Representative uh, uh, Berg. And Madam Chair, Representative Erickson here. Representative Erickson. Madam Chair, I just wanted the committee to know that both Representative Damoth and I did request hearings of this bill so that it would be a parallel to Representative Hassan's bill. We thought that was a very a, a good path to follow so that everyone could have heard uh, the bills side by side. So I just wanted you to know that apparently we were not uh, 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 abided by that request. Thank you. Thank you, Representative uh, Erickson. Um, Repres uh, Representative 
uh, Hassan, uh, would you like to renew your uh, motion to uh, re-refer House File 217 to the Education Finance Committee? Yes, Madam Chair. Um, I would like to renew my uh, motion to re-refer House File uh, 217 to Education Finance. I and, I, and I apologize. I should have asked if you had any final words before that um, re-referral. Um, I just want to thank the young people. I was moved and, uh, you know, touched in so many different ways hearing from young people, all the wisdom that they have shared with us. I hope everyone uh, was listening and uh, we heard those young people. It's the time is now. Thank you. Thank you. So now I'll ask you to re uh, renew that re uh, motion to re-refer House File 217 to the Education Finance Committee. Thank you, Madam uh, Chair. And I renew my motion to re-refer House File 217 to Education Finance Committee. Thank you. And Ms. Larson, can you please take the roll? Chair Richardson? Uh, yes. Vice Chair Hassan? Aye. Representative Erickson? No. Representative Driskowski? No. Representative Bennett? No. Representative Berg? Yes. Representative Bo? Representative Bo? No. Representative Christensen? Yes. Representative Edelson? Yes. <clears throat> Representative Feist? Yes. Representative Frazier? Yes. Representative Jordan? Yes. Representative Keeler? Yes. Representative Moeller? Yes. Representative Mueller? No. Representative Poston? No. Representative Scott? Representative Scott? No. Representative Erdahl, excused. Representative Waslowick? Yes. So the motion uh, carries and the bill is on its way to uh, education finance. There being no further uh, business before the committee, uh, with that, we are adjourned. <laughs>